Jacob, I'll let you know too. We found out this morning that <clears throat> we're not able to use polls to vote because we, there's no way for us to keep the public updated, even if it's like a not anonymous poll. It still is anonymous. Can't see who's voting how. Well, that seems like an important norm for the task members. What I heard you just say, Tristan, is that, so what I hear you saying is that anybody who makes a vote, it has to be a public vote attached to them? Yes. So that, does that suggest a roll call vote might be needed then? Yes. Okay. Crystal, are we good to go ahead and get started? <clears throat> yeah, I was just looking, I think maybe a small group, but that's okay. Um, I have shared the screen. Can you see it okay? We can. All righty, thank you. <clears throat> All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you enjoyed the week break from the task force. Um, and I saw some of you at BP and CISPAC last week, and it was nice to see you in person. Um, we are going to start today for our task force and pretty much just focus in on that, uh, the big buckets that we assigned to you two weeks ago. Um, I think everyone was able to get access. I made it public access, but for some reason it still was making me try to approve them all and I'm sorry about that. Um, I also did get, we got a few emails this morning wanting, you know, so having some questions. Um, Obviously, if we didn't get to those, it's it's been busy here, but um, we can just discuss. And then if we have any questions that need answered, um, we do have Dr. Julie Mergle here as our expert, looking beautiful with her straight hair today. Hi, Julie. <laughs> and um, so hopefully she'll be able to help maybe with some of those questions if I can't answer them or Jacob or Eric. Um, or we could uh, just, you know, table it for next week and kind of go forward with that. So thank you for being here. As uh, I know, the smoke is kind of taking over and the heat and it's not the most beautiful of summer days these days. But uh, again, and thank you to Jacob. I think we are ready to go. Thanks, Crystal. Uh, if you do have questions, we will uh, try to get to those. I don't think there was a spot on the agenda, but we will add one in. So go ahead and go to the next slide, Crystal. I don't see anybody who's new with us today, but as we do refresh, uh, just remember that, uh, feel free to use the chat if you have questions, we'll monitor that. Tristan and Crystal help uh, myself with that. Uh, the raise hand feature we do ask that you use because it's helpful for those of us who are uh, on this end to know who would like to talk versus just trying to monitor uh, if you're unmuting or uh, if you're physically raising your hand, if you use that raise hand feature, it's helpful. Everybody's on mute. We like to uh, keep it that way while just to keep the background noise at a minimum. It can be very distracting and um, we haven't had an issue, but if your name happens to be displayed wrong, uh, you can adjust that using the three dots that are in the upper right hand corner of your picture frame where you are shown. Uh, next slide. <laughs> We are always respectful, supportive, present, and open of everything that we're having in conversation. We've had great conversation to date. Uh, we appreciate everybody's engagement throughout this. Um, <clears throat> next slide, as we make decisions. Uh, again, in our first meeting, we decided that a decision can move forward on consensus. Consensus does not mean a unanimous decision. Uh, this group decided that consensus meant a supermajority or a greater than 60% vote in favor. And we learned at the beginning of this meeting, or at least I learned, uh, that when we take a vote, we need to take a roll call vote so that we know explicitly how every person who is involved 
voted, whether it be yay or nay on any decisions that we make. So we do not have any decisions, I think, to make today as we're hoping to hear from the small groups on your work specific to the broader topics that came forth in the reciprocity research. <clears throat> but moving forward, when we make decisions, uh, we will figure out a process so that we can get everybody's specific opinion on that decision. And so here was our task that we sent you off with, kind of big buckets uh, focused on topics that again came from the reciprocity research and work that was completed and in the report that was shared with you. Those topics were coursework, experience, assessments, uh, any recommendations around advanced credentials, specific um, issues that address military spouses, alternative pathways, and endorsements. And at our last meeting, which was two weeks ago, we said we would work through this going just left to right across the table, allowing the sub uh, groups to present. With that framework, then we'll start with coursework um, and hear what your conversation centered on. Uh, we gave you the outlines of pros, cons, and notes that you have. You also had the freedom to come back with just broad recommendations, or if you had any specific language to the arm itself that you'd like to look at and adjust, we can do that. <clears throat> with that said, coursework, our small group. Uh, anyone who is involved in that group like to kick us off in conversation? Um, this is Sharon Carroll. Go ahead, go ahead, Sharon. Go ahead. No, is, is this Sean? Yeah, it is. Thank you. And actually, I was just going to suggest that since you gave us a, that nice lengthy email this morning, that you be the presenter. <laughs> oh no! Oh no! <laughs> uh, we did now now, and we really haven't. And 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 I think probably let me just say to the group. Uh, and again, I'll apologize. We kind of formed our our stuff a little bit late, um, just this week. So, so um, I'm not sure we really had any pros, cons, and and notes really listed. But I can, but but uh, Sharon, Jewel, do you want me to just go ahead and kind of outline, kind of my thoughts around this? Is that okay? Yes, please. Okay, Jewel, what do you think? You good with that? Absolutely. Thank you. Oh, oh gosh, by consent. Oh, okay. All right. All right. So, so if we go here, can we take a look at the um, the reciprocity uh, coursework on? We don't really have anything around pros, cons, or notes. We can do that. We can put that together. Uh, once again, I just wanted to point out that we kind of put our, our group together a little bit late, uh, if, if you will. So, so we just have some thoughts. Um, I just kind of put some more collective thoughts together around that. If we can take a look at the reciprocity. Um, uh, document on page 13, the coursework. I'd appreciate that. Yes, give me just one second and I'll pull it up. Sure, sure, absolutely. I always feel like we need some elevator music in these Zoom meetings to play while we're transitioning. That, that, that awkward silence, you know what I mean? Okay, I'll fill in. I'll fill in. How about that? Till it gets there, um, I'll go ahead and fill in. And uh, uh, just point out a couple things around that. It, it's really interesting um, in the coursework, and 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 as Crystal pulls that up there and and displays that. Do you want me to? I can I can display it if you want to share. If you want to let me share that, that's just fine. Yeah, page thirteen, top of page thirteen. Can you guys all? Uh, okay, okay, okay. We're getting there. Isn't this exciting? Okay, there we go. And if we can, if we can enlarge that as much as we can, that would be super. And if you can't see that, uh, for each one of you that are out there, go go out and, and load up that uh, particular document yourself just to be able to see that just a little bit better if you if you would like to, uh, if you would like to. Uh, really, something kind of interesting around this, and uh, in my mind, at least of. Uh, of course, of course, oftentimes what's interesting to me is just, I don't know, it's just out here, it's just out there, you know what I mean? Um, so I'm gonna find this document for myself, pull it up here, go side by side on this, uh, this deal, there we go, we've got that right there. And uh, okay, okay, I'm gonna pull it over there. My apologies for being a little bit unorganized. I just, I just, uh, 
got back into the, the little office here. Um, wrong one, wrong one. I've got this though, I got it. There we go, perfect, right there. Okay. Okay, all right. So, and then Crystal, you have that out there for us? Or did you want me to just share it? Why don't you share it? I can't seem to make it bigger with mine. I don't. Okay, I'll try. I'll try to do it. Okay. Tristan, um, can, oh. you, can we let him, can we let Sean share? Yep. <clears throat> Sean, you should be able to see a share screen button on the bottom here. Sorry. Zoom now. Okay, let's, let's uh, share screen. Yay. Okay, all right. We'll just share screen right there. Share screen one. We got it. Okay, all right. And then we'll go ahead and bring this up right there. Can you guys see that better? You tell me. Yes? I think it looks great. Right, perfect. perfect. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. You're welcome. All right. So with that, um, and then we will, um, we'll just leave it as it is. Okay. Um, I highlighted some things. Okay. Am I saying everything just weirdly or wrong? When we take a look at this and we look in the requirements for out of state candidates, uh, it, it speaks to, there's some things that don't really speak to it, to each other within this, I think. The applicants whose degree is more than, so I'll just go ahead. The issue is course worth requirements for out-of-state candidates. Applicants whose degree is more than five years old and who do not have a current out-of-state license must have earned six semester credits from a recently accredited uh, college or university within the five-year period preceding the effective date of the license. Okay, so, so weird issue. Um, applicants whose degree is more than five years old, uh, they would have a license, an out-of-state license. And anybody who doesn't have an out-of-state license, they don't, they don't have a current out-of-state license, they're gonna have to get a license in the state of Montana anyway. Isn't that correct? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah so this doesn't, this doesn't make any sense. Um, and then in addition to that, those who those who may not have uh, Apple, so so rereading this just a little bit further applicants whose degree is more and I'll just kind of restate this so bear with me a little bit um, applicants whose degree is more than five years old okay um, okay that that's that's one issue okay or or do not have a current out of state license um, you know having earned six semester credits well they don't have a license anyway. So why does it matter if they earn six credits or not? Do you see what I'm saying about that? A perfect silence, awkward silence, great. <laughs> this is <All> right. Julie. <laughs> yeah. Um, how are you? <laughs> good, how are you? I'm doing good. So I think a little bit of information background on this would be that um, folks who do have out of state licenses that have been expired, they still have completed an education preparation program mm -hmm. and they they would have to get um, what we call a university recommendation to verify that they've completed that and they've completed their student teaching and or another pathway is that they would have attended an alternative preparation program and need to verify five years teaching experience. Um, so the part here that I think is important is that even if they don't have a license or their license is out of date, um, they still have had the preparation program that they need in order to, um, to apply for the license. And so we're not asking them to go back and get a full new education preparation program. Um, they just need to get some current, if you will, semester credits um, since their license has expired. Okay. If you were in Montana and your license expired, you would also have to um, reinstate your license by completing 60 renewal units and then doing your background check again. But we wouldn't expect you to go back and do your, your educator preparation program all over again. Okay, so, so I think that, that clarification is great, but it, this doesn't say that, it's confusing. What is the effective date of the license, <clears throat> that language? Can someone help clarify that for me? Is that the, the new license that you're applying for or the previous license that, that you would have?
I don't have an answer. Jacob, can you say that again? So the last sentence of the first uh, clause there, um, within, five, within the five-year period preceding the effective date of the license, what license yeah. is that referring to? It has to be an initial license if you're applying for initial license in Montana, because if so, you had a license in Montana um, and it expired, that would be reinstating your Montana license. So this coursework applies to initial licenses only. So it's the effective date of the license you're applying for in Montana, whatever that would be. And that's what it's saying. Or the license that you left. So here, uh, this is what's confusing for me and I, maybe it's just me, I don't know if it's my else. If I come from out of state and I have a license uh, that I earned in nine, uh, 2016 uh, and, I, or, and I taught for a year, which would be 2017, but then I'm coming and I'm applying for a license in 22, but I haven't worked over the last five years. Is, am I talking about the effective date for the license I'm applying for or the one that I had previously that was effective in 2017, so? Your previous license. So if, you're, if you are applying today for an initial license in the state of Montana on July 20, uh, uh, 22nd and your out of state license expired, say on June 30th of 21, then this would apply because your license has expired. Okay, okay, let me understand this then. So, so say I, I graduated uh, from an educational program um, out of state in 2015. Okay, so, so what this is saying is that applicants whose degree is more than five years old, so that would be, that would apply. And, and, I, and I never got my license. Let's say I, in this scenario, I never, I got my license out of state. Okay, I never did. This, this means that I still have to have six credits between 2015 and today in order to be eligible. That's, that seems like a barrier. So if, so no, okay. So say my license expired on June 30th of 2021. Now I have an expired license. That means I need to get six semester credits um, in the next, three years because I would be issued what we call a provisional license in the state of Montana, even though I've done like the praxis exam and passed and I have my educator preparation program and my student teaching and my, you know, background check, all of that. Um, you would not be issued a standard two or a professional license one. You would be issued a class five provisional license in order for you to complete the required six semester credits in the next three years. But this says that that even before is my my understanding is that for reciprocity to take place that applicants, the applicant themselves, that they, they have to, this is what this is saying uh, is that in 2015, I graduated from an educational institution. Okay. Um, I did not get my, my teaching certification okay I'm, I'm from idaho let's just say okay i'm from idaho and it still says i still have to have earned six semester credits uh because it says have a current out-of-state license must have earned six semester credits from a recently accredited college or university within the five-year period preceding the effective date of the license so if i get that license in uh, uh, june 28 2021 this says specifically i have to have those six credits already I just think there needs to be some clarification. Okay, so I think what the point of this table is, it doesn't list all of the necessary coursework that someone needs to do, right? I just wanna point that out. It's about places in current practice under coursework that there could be potential adjustments. So it, it doesn't list every single area that could be potentially be. Right. It's talking about a snapshot of current practice. So the one thing I want to point out with. Um, so what it says is for the requirement, right, you have to have an unrestricted expired out of state teaching license and have 
um, have earned those six semesters of college coursework from a regionally accredited college within the past five years. Okay, so if you don't have an out of state license, then you're technically applying for a new license in the state of Montana, Correct. and the same would apply. You'd still have to get a provisional and, and get six semester credits if when you had attended your preparation program, it was more than five years old. Yeah. But it says so, you must have earned six semester credits. Not, not that you can earn six semester credits. It says you must have earned it. That, that's, that's past. So, so a couple of things here, Sean, if I can sum this up. And Heather, yeah. I see that you have a question I want to get to too. Um, so what's not stated here is what Julie said, that you can get the provisional license, which will allow you to teach, but you can't, you can't, you would not get, if you had a, a full, a quote unquote full license in another state and it had expired, you would not automatically be eligible for a full license in Montana Sure. Uh, without these credit hours. And what I hear you saying, Sean, is just focusing on that issue of earning credit hours, if we look kind of at the second column, is that a barrier? Essentially, that's, that's the question I hear you asking, right? For the group. Yes. Putting, putting well, the it's, group. It, yeah, it's saying, it's saying <laughs> it, as it reads, I'm, I'm just telling you, as it reads, that it says you have to have earned six semester credits from a regionally accredited college, okay, prior to that application. Okay, that's what it says. So now, now it may become a moot point because as we move on, so let's go ahead and just consider that. Let's think about that then move on uh, a little bit to, to the next point. Okay, so the content, context and analysis piece. So it says that, and that, that would be this piece here. If, if that's okay, then we can look at this as a whole basically. So Montana is one of 31 states that require some, uh, some are all out of state teacher candidates to take additional coursework prior to entering the classroom. Okay. Um, no other state specifies this requirement it depends on how recently the candidate's degree was earned. Okay, so, so with that, um, th does the question being, if a person comes in from 2015 or 2010, are they still required to have completed those six credits prior to the application as this particular point says, must have earned? I'm just thinking there's a clarity issue. One thing doesn't speak to another in a clear way. And, and that I, I think, you know, with, with Julie's explanation, adding some clarity around the situation would be, would be, would be more than helpful. And then finally, and finally, um, as regarding these, as I understand it, these six semester credits, okay. Uh, and going clear over here to potential adjustments, um, could uh, Montana could consider uh, its recency requirement for licensure eligibility according to the National Council of Teacher uh, Quality. Recent coursework is unlikely to positively affect a teacher's effectiveness, and such a requirement may de uh, de deter experienced effective teachers from applying for licensure in Montana. Maybe because of this potential adjustment, this is a moot point. Now, the final thing I would say around this is, is that when you're talking about these additional courses, because this does seem to be a barrier to me, uh, definitely a barrier around these additional courses, what kinds of courses um, are those? Is there any place, and I did not find any location that says specifically, what kinds of courses do you, can you take? Do you have to take CNI courses? Do you have to take ed psych courses? What, what kind of courses do you have to take to actually meet those? Or are they renewal credits? But if they're renewal credits, then they're not available outside the state. It just seems like these pieces don't speak to one another. Awkward silence. My interpretation is that there's no statement as to what those courses have to be outside. So of, they could be basket weaving. I assume they have to be education related. But I, teaching, there, teaching license is, related. Yeah. Well, well, yeah, but it, does it have to be? I mean, because renewal credits can be, uh, of course, a renewal credit is classified as that, but they could be uh, learning uh, learning management systems and a number of other things. I think OPI has 56 courses out there for renewal credits, I think. So there's a variety uh, of courses out there. Does it have to be? Could it be a history course if you're a history teacher? I mean, I, you know, it could be basket weaving. I, you know, I don't know. I didn't see any place that it was actually identified. Are they specifically CNI or are they, again, again, Ed Psych would be a great thing to have if you're in computer applications, maybe a networking course that isn't education related. Uh, I mean, I mean, you know, 
I don't know. Who can add context to that? Who makes that decision? I, when I read the arm, I have it up. It does not, it, it just simply says the language that's here. Uh, six semester credits from a college or university does not yeah. say what those credits are in. <laughs> that is correct. So your interpretation of that is correct. There's no, like, it does not say what those six semester credits need to be. And um, Heather asked the question in the chat box, can you use the 60 renewal units? Like instead of going and getting the six semester credits um, from a regionally accredited college or university, could you do 60 renewal units instead? And the answer to that question is currently how rule is written, no, um, you cannot because renewal or credits are for if you hold a license, then it's getting renewed. So that wouldn't even apply to a class five because a class five cannot be renewed. So um, currently the way it's written, it has to be five semester or six semester credits from a regionally accredited college or university. And there's no specificity within rule that says what type of credits. What I also wanna note is if you're an out-of-state applicant and say you did renewal units or some kind or, or participated in professional development as a teacher out of state, um, you can't use those either. I'll say given that again, Julie, how rule is I'm, I'm sorry, Julie, say that, I say that again. I didn't quite catch that. I didn't, that didn't come together for me. Okay, so the notion is you guys, it has to be six semester credits from a regionally accredited college or university. It doesn't say what kind of courses or the kinds of courses that might pre uh, prepare you better or you know, be something of effectiveness, right? But what I wanna be clear about, cause Heather asked the question is, instead of using six, six semester credits, can you use the 60 renewal units? And then maybe attend like, like you're talking about, um, if you get a class five, right? and you've got three years to get these six semester credits done, could you just attend hub courses and, six, and do 60 renewal units? The answer to that is no, given current rule. It is, it is only at this time, you must earn six semester credits. But Sharon, the, you the requirement says must have earned by the time of the application, that's the verbiage. Not not moving forward. I get the I get the you know I get the conversation around you can't use renewal credits, but but potentially could you? I mean that, that's another question. This is prior to, based upon the verbiage that, that we see. Yeah, Thanks, Sharon. So I'm again, go ahead I, and jump I, in. I'm trying to be as clear as I, I possibly I don't know. You can't get a, a a regular teaching license. You can't if you don't have those. If you have not earned them right now today. Um, you can't get a standard two or a class one professional that automatically puts you into the potential of being eligible for a class five provisional, which says then in Montana, we're gonna give you that class five. So that allows you, if you haven't done this, to go ahead and go back and agree that you're gonna take six semester credits within three years. Oh, okay. So, so, so then, then the clarification, first of all, I, I, you know, in my mind, because of the potential adjustment in my mind, uh, why have those six, six, uh, six credits? Because based upon the NT or NCTQ, uh, they, they believe that there's probably very little effectiveness around that. So, um, you know, regardless, you know, uh, anyway, but from a probationary pr class five, a class five perspective, those, those six credits are not required prior to, then we just need to state, you know, the differences between the classes, I, I think, regarding class two or class five. Thanks, Sean. I'm gonna hold that thought if you have yeah. another one. Uh, Sharon, go ahead, and then John, and then Angela. So we've got a queue of people who wanna, wanna jump in. Yeah. Okay, Sharon. thanks. Thank you. And perhaps John and Angela can speak to this a little bit better than, than I certainly could. But, uh, you know, a class five, though provisional, is actually full licensure. So um, that does allow a teacher to fully teach within all of our school systems. A class five allows them some time then to get that coursework done. I know that when I served on a similar committee before, the concern about renewal units was there was some concern about the validity and integrity of the professional development courses when receiving them from another state. It could be though that we make a change that allows out-of-state applicants 
instead of the six semester courses from a college to in fact use our hub for renewal units, be it 60 or fewer. Thank you. John. Yeah, thanks. I, um, you know, it really seems like the purpose of this is to ensure that someone has a current, uh, stayed current with the profession. So if you've had a lapsed license for 10 or 15 years in another state, really doesn't show that you've stayed necessarily up to date with the changes and things that may be happening um, in teaching. It seems like one of the quick and easy things that this person could do would be to get their license renewed in their home state. Right, Julie? Like that would that would take care of it. And then they could transfer that license in and everything would be great. But I was going to say real similar um, is if, if we want them to become current in the profession, then the hub might be a really good way bring them in on the class five and then say, we want you to take some professional development through the hub, you know, that we know is, is good practice and it brings them up to speed with, with what's going on, not only in the profession, but also in Montana. So I, I agree with Sharon that that might be a, a decent work around here. And John, I want to add, right? Like teachers could have access to the hub and it would be free to them. It wouldn't require them to pay to actually, you know, take these credits from a university, if you will. And so we do have that option, right? When you do renewal here, that it's either the six semester credits or 60, re I mean, yeah, or renewal, right? So there is, um, you know, like you're bringing up, there's also some cost effective pieces there. And maybe there could be some more, um, if you will, more relevant and current things that are related to what they're doing in the classroom available on the hub that's not available in coursework, if you will. Angela, I think you had something. Thank you. I think this is a really important uh, and very timely conversation. Uh, and as I sit here, I'm reminded that uh, chapter 58 is also under review and um, I think there's some real opportunities uh, in, in, in what I'm hearing. Uh, first of all, I would encourage the folks on this committee, if you have not already done so, um, to go and watch Julie and Crystal and their outstanding presentations to the Board of Public Ed on Thursday in the unusual cases for licensure. And so I've been churning since then about ways um, that we can tackle some of what I heard um, that day. And I think Sean touches on something here that, that I think could be easily mitigated. We've heard of a couple of options here that I think are entirely doable. Um, what I would also offer, you know, is that we're trying to bring someone in from out of state uh, whose only exposure to Indian education for all uh, wouldn't come from one of our EPPs, it would come from the hub course. Um, and, and I think that we have a real opportunity maybe to consider down the road or at some juncture here in the next couple of weeks to convene with our colleagues who are working on chapter 58. And maybe there's an opportunity for them uh, to address the six credits in a combination course slash student teaching that some that could be uh, happening remotely for folks um, so that they really get a, a, a true professional development. Um, and it's not just any six credits, um, but it is truly designed to support these people in their transition to Montana. And while I think a course or courses on the hub could play a role in that, I also think that there is a role for campus folks to be engaging with uh, new licensees um, who, are, who are seeking to teach Montana students. And so um, I think that there's real opportunities here. Um, and, and, I, and I think that something specific uh, like six credits uh, in, in education from an EPP or a combination of education related courses on the hub and three credits from an EPP, if we're gonna go down that road would be specific and necessary and very helpful here. But I think outside of that, I think we could also do something very innovative with our EPPs through the PEP standards in chapter 58 on this.
other thoughts or comments about this? Thank you, Angela. I, this is Sharon. Angela, yes. I agree. I, I think that maybe um, a combination of those semester um, college courses and renewal units could be a good workaround here. And I look forward to whatever the Montana University system might be offering with regard to some innovation there. Um, that sounds like we look forward to hearing more about that. Well, I, I don't know. I mean, I think chapter 58 is under review and I think that there's some real opportunities here uh, for something in the PEP specific to what Sean pointed out here is, is the absence of something specific, right? And we know that we've had those three courses for a long time, uh, you know, at the administrative level. Um, but what does that look like for other licensees coming in, uh, seeking, uh, seeking to, to be in the classroom? What does something specific like that look like? Um, so I'm glad that that you're that you're interested. I'm, I'm very intrigued. I think there's some real possibilities for us here, but I don't think it's anything that we can do right alone through chapter seven, chapter 57. But we could pave the way for uh, six credits specific to this and this, and pass it off to the chapter 58 folks, and maybe even you know have maybe a subcommittee of the two groups come together. I mean, yeah, Angela about flexibilities. We're talking about being innovative. I think that that really gets us to a place um, where we're addressing uh, Sean's uh, point. Yeah. So, Angela, like I think that really does provide a really potential opportunity, right, to allow multiple pathways, because currently, right, if you have to get those six six semester coursework, um, you want to take something you haven't already taken. And a lot of times our universities are, are offering what are required courses and not optional ones that kind of enhance unless you're going for an advanced license. So is there you know, some courses that could be designed at the university that are not courses that you normally take um, to be prepared to be a teacher that are, are in addition to advanced kinds of coursework, but maybe have some more variety of some things that you would be taking postgraduate that are not postgraduate credits, if that was an option for folks. Thanks, Julie. Sean, coming right back to you, just quick point of clarity. Essentially, we're talking about two courses, right? Because it's six credit hours, assuming majority of courses are three credits. So for that frame, <clears throat> Sean. All right, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, um, and great points, everybody. Um, and uh, I think, uh, what was it, John and uh, uh, Sharon and Angela, thank you very much for, for those points and, and that, that conversation around that. Um, however that, that sorts out, it, it, seems, it seems to me two things uh, come to mind. Regardless, there needs to be more clarity within that particular, um, uh, those particular requirements, whether, whether it becomes um, uh, you know, like a level five or a level two uh, kind of licensing structure. And if that's clear to people coming in from out of state and, and that, that solution around, you know, if they could go ahead and get, uh, get uh, um, uh, recertified within their state, that makes it easier to come in. I mean, just these kinds of ideas within this can really help simplify and, and, and minimize barriers. The other point I'd like to just like to go back to is uh, because based upon the NCTQ and the clear over there on that right side where it says potential adjustments and I stopped the share on that, um, you know, that, that adjustment, that recommendation was stated again that it's unlikely to positively affect the teacher's effectiveness. Um, so I think we just need to keep that in mind based, based upon that particular uh, recommendation or, or, or suggestion at least. So uh, which, which makes some of these other ideas a moot point. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. So go ahead, John. Yeah, just quickly, I wanna point out that although NCTQ has come to that decision on, on their own, uh, the research would typically say that people who stay current in their profession do have more effectiveness and so that's why we require renewal units. That's why schools offer professional development on a regular and ongoing basis. Um, so I, I don't know that I would necessarily agree with NCTQ's comment. I would agree with it in the fact 
that Sean was talking about is if someone is coming in and taking six, uh, six credits of uh, electives in an unrelated field just to get some college credits, absolutely that's not going to help them. But if someone is coming in and taking targeted specific educational courses, it will have a direct impact on their effectiveness, specifically if they're taking things um, that are designed uh, to meet the needs of Montana schools, uh, our IFEA, um, trauma-informed practices, other things that are really big in our schools right now, that will make them more effective. So um, I think we need to be a little careful with that NCTQ quote. Sure. Eric, are you familiar with that uh, work by NCTQ? I, I wonder out loud if they were looking at teachers who generally were transitioning states versus teachers who may have a gap in service too. Yeah, I think it's it's more about the transition and, you know, like requiring applicants to take the course on Indian education. That's that's a value that's important to Montana, as Angela said, and it's actually in the Constitution. So, you know, that's likely not something to be changed, but people can take that course for free on the hub, as was pointed out. So should cost be a barrier or logistics be a barrier if someone is not close to a college or university in Montana, you know, is the time and expense um, and the modality, um, maybe you could take your six credits you need online. Um, possibly that's true. Maybe John knows <laughs> if there are still any courses where you have to be at a physical campus because it's just not offered online anymore. But um, if there is anything that would create a challenge for anyone getting those six credits, are there alternatives such as a certain number of um, classes people could take on the hub or some combination of the two? I, I don't remember who brought it up, but having some kind of choices for people and what those choices might look like. Um, you can't come to MSU and take an IFEA course. Uh, we weave it throughout our program. And then actually all of our students take the course on the hub at the end of the at the end of their program to get the certificate, to get them used to using the hub. Uh, we think it's very valuable, the information. Uh, most of our faculty and staff have taken that. And uh, so again, some type of a combination of options or different things. Um, I think we're all kind of saying the same type of thing that um, there may be different ways to do this more targeted and more specifically to get people coming in from out of state who don't have a current license uh, brought back up to speed about what's going on in the profession and then, and then rolling them into that class too. Diane, did you still have something you wanted to share? On mute. I, I, do, I, I think I, will, I am being redundant, but certainly what I think is that Indian Ed for All is an important um, factor in our state and important to our, our teaching uh, cadre. And so I can see a combination of things, including that. Um, but I, I would not want to forego completely any preparation coming in to teach, teach in Montana. But I'm certainly open to hearing suggestions and what might make it easier and more meaningful for folks to come into the state. Diane, I just want to like reiterate the importance that you're bringing up about EFA, right? Um, you cannot even get a class five until you've completed the EFA course on the hub. So that's a condition to even get the class five uh, before um, these other six credits in addition to that. So um, that it has such an importance and value as you've mentioned, Diane, that it's a requirement to even get the license. And I would want that to stay. Thank you. It's almost like what I'm hearing is like an introduction to Montana teaching, a combination like a packaged course. And, and I'm just kind of taking some notes because I will visit with our folks about this. And I think there are some, there's some real promise here. And it could be a, a combination too of making sure that they're in the classroom, that while they're in the classroom for that first semester, that they have the field support that they need um, to be most successful. Um, so certainly not taking anything anything off the table. What a good uh, good dialogue. 
I have a quick question now. So, and, and for Julie with the IFA, so you can't get a a um, uh, level five licensure without taking the IFA, uh, completing that course. And I'm, I've, and my my apologies if I'm not getting the the acronyms and things exactly right. But you can't you can't get um, a probationary license if you haven't taken that IFA. Is that correct? That is correct, Sean. Okay, so for somebody coming in from out of state, um, you know, even whether they have a current license or, or, or maybe their license have lapsed for just a few years. And, and, and I know when I, I stated, you know, 2010 or 2005, uh, I exaggerate the point a little bit. Um, uh, so, so I understand that. That's, it's not, it, it seems like a barrier how can that barrier be minimized? Or, or again, for the scenario, somebody coming in from out of the state, they want a, a probationary license. They can't do it until they do this course. What, 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 can, what can minimize these barriers? So I think some of the things that have already been in place um, to somewhat minimize those barriers, Sean, is that the course is on the hub. It is something that folks can take remotely. It's self-paced. Um, and we work to get those, um, because there's some pieces on there, they have to do like a, a constructive response, if you will. So we work here at the agency to really be sure that we're scoring those responses and getting back to people in a really timely fashion. So we try to make it available free, you know, remotely, um, in a t you know, and try to really be sure that that is done in a way that um, it can be efficient for someone uh, regardless of if they're, you know, out of state. Yeah. Is there like a licensure pathway job aid of some kind that people get so they can understand all the intricacies? Because this sounds complicated. <laughs> so Sean, I think that's a really good point, right? So there's the part of there's rule and then there's the processes you know, of what it, uh, what you have to do, you know, to, to, to go online to your MSIS account and apply and do all of these things. And so um, I would say that, you know, I think it is really important for us to have real time information on the web page, you know, that people can access and ways for folks to understand kind of some of these complexities that you bring up. So we do reference folks quite often to our web page, but I think, Sean, that's a point that is really important. Is there ways that we can make that even better for folks so that it isn't so complex that it seems really straightforward of what you need to do, what you're eligible for? So we try to do that. I'm just not sure that, you know, it's maybe as much as we need, if you will. Yeah, you know, I, I teach I teach performance analysis, and 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 within that field, uh, that uh, you know those job aids and those little things like that that can help improve performance. And in this case, people understanding the procedure to actually get a probationary licensure it, it is vital. Otherwise, if it's too difficult, people just throw it away, toss it, don't do it. Kind of how we are. If I could just reiterate what um, Julie said about the accessibility of the hub course, it is accessible. It is accessible, I think, Julie, to everyone. I mean, I went on and created a profile and um, took it. In fact, we emulated what the OPI had created and we created our Indian Education for All for One MUS course. And um, uh, our folks across our campuses are taking it. And um, it, it takes about an hour and a half to complete. It's accessible uh, from your couch. Um, and doesn't take a long time. Um, and I think it's a real opportunity and certainly a building block for someone to come in, take that course, and then take, take any six credits, whether we package them or not. I just think it's a real good start and a, and a welcome to Montana um, and, a, and, a, and an overview of our first peoples that, that is really exciting and a great opportunity for them. So just one piece to put in our our quiver here that I hear people talking about is there, there could be a need for something outside of the arm that is sort of a decision tree for people who are coming in applying for a license as to like do you have this then this is the step do you you know you need to complete these things sort of um, to help them out that doesn't require a change in arm but could be beneficial to break down some potential barriers uh, for people coming in. <clears throat> 
because I, I and this hopefully is clarity for the group. If if I come from another state and I just don't pay a lot of attention and just go fill out an application uh, on wherever I do that at <laughs> for a license, and I say I apply for a class one thinking that I'm eligible, and I'm not. Do I get recommendations back of saying like I'm you're not eligible for this, but you are eligible for class five? Okay. I see Julie shaking her head. Yes. So that's yes, Jacob. Yes. Yeah. Eric, you had your hand up for a moment. I just did briefly. I was just thinking because I know we want to hear from some of the other groups too. It sounds like uh everyone believes in the value of recent knowledge about teaching. Um, whether that comes in the form of hub courses or college courses, it, it does seem like people really like that and feel that's essential that someone who wants to teach be current in the field, or at least be working towards getting current in the field. Um, sounds like, you know, the Indian education for all is an important and essential piece, and that is not likely to change. Um, so it seems like any potential changes around that is there any flexibility to for someone to get recent experience that does not necessarily require earning six semester credits and whether you know that can be accomplished outside of arm or not that maybe is the question so possibly this subgroup could make a recommendation that we look at that flexibility um or it could be we kind of go through the arm and, you know, kind of see if there are potential wording changes or both. So just a suggestion or process. Thanks, Eric. Anything else from that coursework group? I uh, appreciate those thoughts and where the conversation got us and, and what we're uh, doing here is capturing sort of these bullet points that we can then bring back as specific areas to tackle on. Uh, if, if the group's in favor, I feel like we're most productive to sort of hear from everyone and then capture where the overlap is and may help us be more targeted as we move forward too versus focusing much on one thing right now. All right, so the Next group then, if there's nothing else from our coursework friends, the next group would have been experience. Our experience group. Anyone like to take the lead there? Is anyone with us today from that group? Um, Tristan, do you have the, I don't have it up right now, who was a member of our experience group? Um, Heather, Jarrett, and Carrie, was it Bertillo? Heather, you have your hand up. Heather, are you with us? No, I don't. Uh, says she's with us. Maybe she stepped away. Okay, I'm right here. Oh, so hey. my phone internet just crashed all of a sudden, so I had to switch to my phone. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no worries. Uh, Heather, we were just uh, jumping into the experience group, so if you have anything you'd like to like to okay. share with us. Okay, um, I have lots. So most of most of what um, Carrie and I came up with were a lot of questions um, about the experience piece. Um, but I did put into our shared document that you know one of the positives about um, the experience piece is three years is very consistent throughout the whole um, chapter until the we get to the con, which is the only really one deviation from that three years is when we're talking about out-of-state teachers, then it jumps to five. Um, and so that's kind of what Carrie and I talked about. And I know she's unable to join us today. Um, but 
mostly, like I said, we had a lot of questions. And so um, I guess I'll just kind of share what those are and maybe, maybe people could answer them if they have them and then that would help. Um, but so one of the first questions was, how are the years of experience collected? Um, is that solely the licensure office's task is to get that verification from, from employers? And, and I guess that kind of leads into another question of, is there a better way to have that happen so that it helps the licensure office out? Um, so that's a question. And then I'm, all, we also wondered, you know, what are other states doing when they are collecting that verification? Um, is there maybe a, a standard system across other states? Um, are we making it more difficult than we need to be? We just kind of were curious about that. And then just as a point of clarification, um, you know, the, the law or chapter 57 says that the superintendent will determine the appropriate educational experience. Is that just tasked to the licensure office and they interpret that um, on her behalf or that person's behalf? That's a lot of questions so far and I'm not even done. So I don't know if we wanna pause and if somebody could answer some of those or what would be best? Hi, Heather, it's Julie. Yep, Hi. I can answer those pretty quick. And John put a comment in the box uh, to your first question. So the folks who have to have five years of experience would be out of state teachers who attend an alternative pathway for an educator preparation program. They have to have five years of experience with that. Um, and that kind of replaces the student teaching component in some way, whether their alternative program did or didn't have it. It is true that that's the only place in rule where there's a five-year mark. Uh, for example, to move from a standard license, teaching license to a professional requires three years of experience. Mm -hmm. So your second question about verification of employment. There's a form that gets sent to an employee or an applicant, I'm sorry, called a verification employment form that uh, it's called a V and it gets sent to them from a licensure specialist for them to take to an employer and complete it and return it to the OPI. Then a licensure specialist will be looking at that um, as, a, uh, in, uh, as authorized by the superintendent, if you will, to ensure that the experience that's listed is, is uh, experience from a, a full year or whatever from a accredited K-12 school. So they, and they have to, in that verification, they also have to be licensed and attend and be working at an accredited school. That's how rule is written for those years of experience. So it's not just any experience. It can't be experience at a non-accredited school and it can't be um, any kind of experience when you're not uh, fully licensed somewhere. Um, so that's what I share with you. I hope I've answered all of your questions. Yes, I think to date you have, that's awesome. Thank you. Um, let me see here. Julie, what rule is the five years listed in? I was just gonna pull that up quickly so people could 410, see it. 413. 410 and 413. Jacob, it would be 50, I'd be 1057, 410. Okay. <clears throat> and then once you get to 410, it's D. Yeah, 4D, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so I guess maybe just the rest of the questions are kind of have been answered as we've already been discussing some things, but my other, or the, our last question was, what about supervised teaching experience? How does that factor in? Um, and so that wouldn't be a part, if I am understanding correctly, of the alternative piece but is there any other way that that supervised teaching experience factors into experience as we're having that discussion? Not currently, no. Okay. All right. We so do think, see many sorry. applicants 
um, who might have attended an alternative pathway and have verification that they completed the program, maybe even student teaching and have taught for three years, but they're not eligible to come and get a class five, even a class five, even a provisional because they don't have a total of five years. Okay. That is a frequent question that comes. So Julie, would you mind just sharing more about what, like what are the, what's an example, I guess, of an alternative pathway um, just for clarification purposes? So it would be a program maybe for like, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the Texas system at all. They have um, they have a, a, an additional layer in there from districts to the state level. They have these regions, if you will. Um, and so um, in Texas, the regions do put together um, teaching pathway programs that are alternative programs where they bring them in and require them to do um, coursework um, as well as then like a student teaching or an internship kind of, of program. So it's a, a pathway that is different from a, a traditional university setting. Um, there's some others as well. Um, I know that there's like, um, and Jacob, I don't remember the exact name of it, but there's like one in the Northwest, um, like Northwest something, um, Teach for America. Those are kinds of alternative pathways, if you will. So like troops to teachers, is that another example? Yeah, I think you can characterize it by typically, it's almost an accelerated pathway. So typically you work while you're in your in your coursework, your education coursework as well with, you know, and it's a two to three year program where in the end you have a full license, but you've worked throughout that three years in a classroom. Um, I personally was an alternative certified teacher when I was in the classroom. Uh, so I, I, you, my program, I had to have a job in order to get into the program. Uh, so I obtained a special education teaching job, then was able to enter into the alternative certification program, had two full years of coursework. Uh, and that was a, a full load, uh, 15 credits per semester. Um, and then in the third year was um, the internship class they considered um, in the classroom with a mentor teacher. And then by the end of the third year, I was able to apply for a full state license. So versus having four years of coursework and then end student teaching and then license is sort of your working while building the plane. And Jacob, that's a really good example. You might have been a career changer, maybe potentially, meaning you had a bachelor's degree in another arena. Right. Uh, yes. So that's another thing that's available many times out of state is where there is somebody who does have a already has a bachelor's degree and they're just wanting to add on um, the methodology for teaching. So um, I just add that as well. There are some universities and colleges um, that do have alternative programs that um, are affiliated with the university, if you will. They're not, not necessarily always not affiliated with the university. And I do believe at some point, and Angela might know or John, but I do think at some point there might've been some alternative programs that were offered in Montana um, at maybe MSU Bozeman, I'm not sure. But um, so I do wanna reiterate, it doesn't necessarily always mean it's not affiliated with the university. So Sean, you had a question. Yes, the five years is something that comes up as problematic as a barrier sometimes to getting some teachers in Montana. Can I speak to that? Um, so that conversation came up, you know, for 410 and, and I believe 413 as well. Um, around the same time, I think 2017, uh, you know, as part of that rural educator recruitment and retention work early on. And in fact, I think if you look at the Rise for Montana literature, I think they have that in there as one of those early um, licensure changes as a result of that work. So 410 and 413, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but I think Scott's point is a, is, is a really, um, is a really good one. Um, Sean's point, I'm sorry. Um, you know, if we could uh, reduce that, I think that the group uh, was really mindful of what, um, of what might, what, what the group might be willing to, what the Board of Public Ed might be willing to move forward. Um, you know, and, and so I, I think that, uh, you know, if we could make a change to that, 
um, that that might be the, be the crux of that. And then um, to this conversation around um, alternative pathways, that was uh, mine and jo John's, excuse me, and John's group. And we had one other group member, and I don't know if I'm seeing them on right now, but we talked a little bit, just, I mean, just a little bit about how rather than than discussing and researching those, how we wanted to maybe explore some innovation, like Julie alluded to, within our own EPPs in Montana, and what um, that innovation might look like, uh, as far as, as Chapter 57, um, and alternative pathways to getting folks out into out into the classroom. And one of the things that we're having some real preliminary conversations already now, uh, with existing rule. Um, and within existing statutes is an advanced student teaching model um, that would put student teachers out into a classroom um, as, as licensed teachers. Um, so through through the emergency authorization, um, you know, because it's 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 happened uh, this past year. Um, and so anyway, so what we're trying to do is really to try to put trying to put some sideboards on that so that uh, uh, everybody from the EPP to the K-12 school that is hiring uh, this teacher who's still studying uh, is, is communicating effectively and so that we can best support them and that we don't diminish quality uh, at all. And so what we wanted to talk about as part of our group down the list uh, is, is how can we explore that innovation um, rather than some of these other alternative pathways, because we do have some, some alternative pathways. And I would say that the Masters of Arts in Teaching is one of them. Um, you're bringing those people in with the bachelors and then they get their masters of arts within one year with only 10 days on campus and so some real art alternative creative ways we have our two plus twos um, in partnership with our tribe two of our tribal colleges and some of our other two-year campuses across the state so there is some innovation how can we explore more through chapter 57 is i think what our group wanted to talk about john go ahead Yeah, I just wanted to quickly add uh, the five years does seem inconsistent with the rest of the rules. Mm -hmm. um, there are so many different models of alternative uh, preparation. And if you want to call them alternative certification, al alternative preparation, you know, we can't even agree on what to call them. Um, there are varying levels of strength in those programs. Um, and if you look at models across the country, Minnesota, for example, um, you have to, if you, let's say we teach for America, teach for America can't operate in Minnesota without a higher ed partner. And so higher ed partners with those alternative prep programs, uh, to ensure that their standards are met, but not to get in the way of their innovation. And so it's supposed to be a partnership between innovation, doing things differently, and then the higher ed really making sure that all of the standards have been met. In Texas that Julie talked about, uh, for a number of years, Texas had district level licensing. So I could work in uh, Fort Lauderdale uh, or Fort Lauderdale, not Florida. That would make no difference. Uh, I, I, I could be in Dallas and get a, a license to teach in Dallas that wasn't recognized anywhere else in the state of Texas. So that's very problematic. Um, and there's everything in between the two of those. Um, in in MSU, we've, we've had a couple of, of, I don't know if the first one was considered an alternative pathway, but the uh, Northern Plains transition to teaching, and that was operated under a grant, primarily online. Uh, you came in with a, with a bachelor's degree, ended with a master's and a teaching license, and uh, we ran that for, for several years. Um, right now, as Angela alluded to, we are running what we call the Masters of Arts in Teaching, um, I don't know that it's a true alternative pathway, but it's definitely something that's very different than the norm in, in that you have to have that, that bachelor's degree. It does have a year-long residency, uh, and we, we um, have it geared to finish in a year. So someone comes in with a math degree, gets the math license. Um, so I, I don't know, again, if that would be truly an alternative pathway, but it's definitely different from the norm where our NPTT may have been a little bit more closer to an alternative uh, a pathway, but looking at how we offer things differently, and, and Angela and I can talk about that, and just our other person was Dean. Um, so when it's our turn, probably you know in a week or two when we get to this, um, we're happy to, to talk more about this. 
So um, I don't know. Well, let me ask a question. So I am actually a pretty good case study for this, I think. Um, so my program was through a university. Uh, and like I said, so at the end of year three, I obtained a full teaching license uh, in the state of Kentucky, which essentially would be like the class two here. Um, and my program granted a master's degree when I finished because I already had the bachelor's. So at the end of year three, I would have had three years of teaching experience, a master's degree and a full teaching license in the state of Kentucky. But the way I read this, I would not necessarily be eligible for a license in Montana because I did not have the five years of experience. Um, That's correct. <laughs> yep. And so say even in the event, so I have more than five years of teaching experience now, but if I, if I was to only have four years of teaching experience at this point in my career, uh, I have valid teaching license in multiple states. I have an administrator's license in Oregon. Um, but if I had only had four years of teaching experience, even with those things, I would not necessarily be eligible for a, a standard teaching license in Montana with the five years experience. What, Correct. You would be eligible to um, either you would need to stay out of state and get your fifth year of experience prior to coming to Montana to be eligible for the two, or you would be eligible to a five and you would have to go back to school to complete a, a complete a full educator preparation program in order to get your full license. Yes, so I would I, I would only be eligible in Montana for a provisional license. And I would have to go back and do a full four years of teaching program in order to be eligible to get a full teaching license in Montana. <clears throat> Jacob, we wouldn't know what to do with you when you showed up on our door if you'd already completed that much of a program somewhere else. It would be uh, a wonderful uh, puzzle to try to, to noodle out with you. Yeah, right. I mean, I also have a PhD in education too. Right. I mean, again, I have more than four years, but if we take that, if we take that and said I only had four years teaching experience, which would not be out of the realm, uh, that makes me a, a sort of a an outlier case study for this that could get caught up in the fold. <clears throat> that was part of the conversation I had with with Julie and with Crystal on Friday about the unusual cases. I said, uh, you know, I said I really stayed on to hear the conversation so that I could decipher what is the exception. In, in what is coming to them and what we're seeing today versus what is the rule? What are we seeing uh, uh, cases increase around? Um, and I think that's part of what we need to fetter out in, in our conversations here. And some of that, of course, is the board's purview to fetter out is, does a Jacob Williams case come before them as an unusual licensure case? Um, so I think there's, there's still a pathway for, for the Jacob Williams and those circumstances, and that's through the Board of Public Education um but where are we seeing the hiccups where are we seeing the hang-ups consistently and if the number of rule number of years is a consistent challenge then let's try and tackle it today so we have 15 minutes anybody have ideas around that <clears throat> or, or i actually heard a question from angela did, did you guys find any of those cases like did you come to any can any in that conversation like what as to what is being seen that could help inform this situation or are there are there a lot of me out there coming to montana trying to get licenses or <clears throat> so jacob there's about 47 percent of the initial applicants are from out of state um this is a, an issue that comes up very frequently in licensure this five-year component and so I, I just, I reiterate to you that it's, it's happening a lot. And that's difficult for people because they're like, oh, do I just stay back? I could do another year. But if I go to Montana, that means I've got to go back to school and I'm going to have to pay some money and then I've got to give up time. Um, so it is a barrier. And I think John had mentioned it too, like it is um, inconsistent, the five years, like to get an administrative license, you teach for three years and you can, you know, get the administrative license, you can move from the standard to the professional with three years. This is the only place where the five shows up. I just want to point out one thing, that's the highest requirement in the country. 
Uh, most states, if they do have a requirement for number of years of experience with the alternative pathways, it's around two to three is the average. Do you know what you see there in licensure, Julie? What is typical? I mean, what are they trying to transfer to Montana with? Do we know? Um, generally like a three to four years. Mm -hmm. um, we don't see very many with one, if you will. Because a lot of folks, right? Like, like Jacob was mentioning, he had to do three years and then he got all of that. So generally speaking in other states, they, they don't just enroll, they get the alt. They generally have some more than two years of experience. Like uh, John had mentioned like Teach for America, even if it's like Minnesota affiliated with the university, they still have to do two years in that program. So generally you don't see someone coming through to licensure and an alt pathway with less than two years of experience. But the zone that's the difficulty is that zone between the two to, two to five, if you will. And then Julie, of the 47% that seek licensure, um, out of that percent, how many don't get it? Do you have that? Whether it's for um, this person or others? You know, that's a really good, Good data dive, maybe potentially, Angela, be something we could take a look at. Um, when I say 47%, I'm not even absolutely sure of which licenses they're applying for, right? Is that because they're applying for a two, a one, a three, you know, like where does that 40% live? Um, and is it proportionate across all, right? Or is it 40% more high? Is like of the 40% or 80% applying for a five or of the 47% applying for a two? I'd have to dig into that number a little bit more to have more information for you. I think that would be really helpful. I was just talking with someone from CISPAC and they indicated that the percentage of what they thought uh, of, of the class eights who might not uh, meet the, the qualifications there. And so I, I just think that would be really helpful uh, if we knew what percentage, what breakdown, what that, that breakdown of that 47% looked like. And if we had any details as to the why behind um, any denials. Because to think that close to 50% of our applications for licenses are coming from out of state makes me think that we've really got to have serious conversations around that. And I, I just think to be most informed about the dynamics of, of or the different pieces of that, I think would be very helpful so that we address the right issue and get you the solution that would be most helpful to these applicants and to our schools. I'm trying to capture those questions. Essentially, it was what percent of the applications are from out of state? What licenses are they applying for? And what percent are denied and why, if we know? It might also be interesting because we talked about this at the last meeting, where are they employed once they do get that license? So yeah, John, that's a really, I think it was you, John, who just said that. That's a really critical question because we do see even a disproportionate amount of class five provisional licenses teaching in rural or what we would consider a comprehensive school, the schools with the highest needs. So yes, it's not necessarily always proportional, if you will, when we look at who's got the class two versus the, the provisional. I see that Sean put a comment, you guys, in the, in the text box too, that I think is a really interesting point. If I could offer, I think that as we talk about um, licensing and applicants coming in from out of state and, and especially considering where they land and perhaps so many of them in rural Montana, um, perhaps it circles us back to our first conversation about what supports do they have once they come into Montana, because I wonder um, you know, if we did a deep dive and, and tracked those teachers, how long did they stay in those rural communities? I mean, if we're gonna make licensure changes here at this table, uh, maybe we also talk about that, that piece uh, of, of those six credits that a person coming into Montana um, with or without A or B has to have within a certain amount of time so that we can ensure that they're getting the support that they need 
regardless of where they land so that they're going to stay there or that they're going to stay in Montana. I mean, because we know that so many people go out to a district and they stay there for maybe a year and then they start job hunting uh, in our larger communities. And so I think part of what we need to consider here is can we make some innovative changes that would not only draw those teachers into these rural communities from out of state, but also support them in being able to stay there. Um, so that we're not um, constantly coming back to say, oh, we need to, we need to do this and this and this to, to address folks who want to come in from out of state. Um, but we need to address those who have come in from out of state and make sure that we have the supports in place to keep them here in Montana and to keep them in the places where they're needed the most. And I think there may, there may be some opportunities in that initial conversation that we had around that coursework. Uh, for continued licensure in Montana. And I don't want to create more barriers, but I guess I would ask the group to consider what are we doing to address our situations if we just change the requirements to get somebody in here and get them to a rural, rural community in Montana if we don't support them in staying there and require yeah. supports in place. Thanks, I'm gonna, Angela. I'm going to just add a couple of points here uh, from a teacher's perspective. And just from living in rural Montana and being um, a teacher on a reservation, or I, I, I know that in some cases, there aren't enough supports for teachers to remain in a setting and be successful. And so that's one of the reasons, you know, I feel very strongly about um, a lot of information on Indian Ed for all. But additionally, there has been, and I certainly don't mean in all districts, but in many districts, a tendency for uh, not to realize that it may take a bit of time for a teacher to acclimate to a community and provide the support they need to stay there and be successful. So, uh, you know, using that, those transition credits uh, to provide uh, the right information and the right supports to have folks stay, and then for perhaps the school district to uh, keep them past the time they would otherwise get tenure and have provided the supports that they need in order to be um, fitting into the school district and successful there. I think in the past, we've maybe not provided all the supports we need for our teachers either. So it's a, it's a double edge there. We can be as easy as we can to get teachers in, but we also have to work to keep them in the community and provide the supports they need to be successful. Thank you. Um, you made me think about one thing there that I thought was interesting. In the class four, the renewal process is different for a class four for a CTA teacher than the renewal process for, for a class two or a class one, right? Is um, you have to take certain renewal credits. So you have to take, for example, um, you know, a teaching methodology piece because for, for CTAE, many times we have folks that come from industry into the field and are teaching CTAE courses. Um, so it's an interesting piece is that in class four, it's just not any six semester credits or 60 renewal. They do have a couple of components that are required courses that then are offered on the hub to move that first renewal. So if you get that five years, then your first renewal, there's some requirements within that five years. Um, and I'm just bringing it up. I think it's just interesting dynamic there of something that's in four that's not in the others. I'm not saying we need to put it in. I'm just sharing you guys. No, I think these are, this is really an interesting conversation. And part of what I got to thinking about after Thursday's presentations to the Board of Public Ed too, is this notion of graduated licensure, not only for our newly licensed folks, but perhaps for our folks coming in um, to provide these supports, to keep them where uh, we can ensure they have support so that they stay uh, in some of these communities. Um, and I think if we look at our retention data nationally, I think it shows large numbers, close to 50% of our folks leaving the profession after the first three years. Um, so it may be something that we have a conversation around here can we uh, do something in Montana in relation to graduated licensure so that we can, by design, make sure that folks who are gonna get a license here have the supports they need to stay in the, in the profession and to stay where they're at in the profession. So Angela, I, I wanna wrap up with that uh, in the last five minutes. I appreciate what you're saying. 
Uh, I don't know if it's clear for the rest of the group. It's not for me. So I guess I'm asking a selfish question as to where in the arm these supports could be could be put that you're discussing. Well, I think it would depend on which license we wanted to tackle first. I think that there's multiple opportunities. We could do a graduated licensure for, for the, the person seeking licensure out of, out of state coming into Montana and then put put some graduated steps in place. Uh, an administrator coming into Montana and put some graduated steps in place. Uh, one of the other things I've been chewing on is class eight and maybe some graduated steps there as well. Um, so that, you know, it, licensure wouldn't just be a, a one uh, a one time deal and then you wait five years and you come back, right? Um, but it would be a, you apply for your license, you meet certain sets, a certain set of standards uh, and then over the course of a certain time period, you would take some critical steps to meet certain thresholds where you would have supports in meeting them, coursework, et cetera. Um, and uh, you would get full licensure um, after meeting A, B, and C. And I mean, it's a, it would be a lot of work, um, but I just think that uh, we, are, we are trying to, we have a pipeline into our educator prep programs and what we need to do, I think, is find ways, whether it's through licensure or other means, to make sure that once we train these teachers, uh, that they have the supports they need to stay in the profession. Otherwise, their investment uh, goes to waste, um, and um, our investment, uh, you know, is just not most most wisely used. And so, I just think it's really, really important that we uh examine how um, we can support them better so that they are more likely to stay in the profession so that they don't have to change course after a couple of years and decide that they education wasn't for them and i think maybe Does anybody have any questions before we wrap up for the day? We just have a couple minutes left. Uh, when we come, so we've captured notes today and what I wanna do is be sure we send out sort of key highlights of where we found pressure points today through this conversation to the group. Uh, when we come back next week, uh, I would hope we can hear from the rest of the groups. If you didn't get a chance to, to have your meeting and you're in uh, assessment, the advanced credentials, military spouses, alternative pathways group, and you need more time, you have it until next week. Uh, endorsements as well, but hopefully we can rip through the rest of those next week and, and hear those comments and then identify the rest of those pressure points where we can tackle. As anticipated, we're seeing a lot of overlap, not just in sort of out of state teachers, but in state as well, that I think will, will be beneficial for us as we move forward. Um, I, I, it would be helpful, John and Angela, as you think about this tiering system, um, if we had an example to see potentially, I am in, internally sort of thinking about, well, how does it, how might it look different for the, the pre-service teachers coming through a program in Montana and the teacher who may be coming from out of state uh, and how that plays and, and is or is not the, the in-state teacher seems very fluid. Uh, the out-of-state teacher seems, the question seems to be, are we, would we putting additional negatives in place for some and, and not for some? So I don't know if there's examples well, Jacob, of that, so that would be beneficial. I give you a quick, Jacob, I can give you guys a very quick example. So in the state of Colorado, they have a tiered licensure system. So even though I was prepared um, in Montana uh, through a, a traditional education preparation program, went to Colorado to apply for a license, a teaching license, you're automatically put in a provisional. And then you move from a provisional after three successful years, you apply, then you can move to a professional, if you will. The same applies for an administrator in the state of Colorado. So there's many states that kind of have these tiered things that regardless of where you enter, you enter in on a, pro a provisional based upon a um, quality experience and credits, then you can move to the were you next required level. <laughs> to do additional, Were you required to do additional coursework or the supports to move from that or just complete the three years of teaching? Get your three years of successful teaching and then uh, the renewal units. And then instead of getting just like renewed with the provisional, you got the professional. Right. 
I don't know if that helped. <laughs> Did they have to come in with any experience in Colorado? Do you have to come in with experience? Do you have, to have experience to come in to only be and then then to get the provisional? I'd have to look into that. I don't know if you came in with with experience, would you still only get the provisional? That's a good question. Take a look. Okay, that was really interesting information. Thank you. So we're at the top of the hour, so we will wrap up. I uh, will continue with those next groups uh, next week. And uh, I said the goal will be to hear from each of those and then really be able to identify the pressure points on top of what we got today to dig in for some specific recommendations of change. Thank you, everybody, for your time today. Great discussion. I think we made more progress today than we have in previous meetings in terms of getting to some, some specifics outside of that work we did around the counselor path. Uh, appreciate your time and we'll see you again next week.